This podcast is brought to you by StarCharge, the largest EV charging manufacturer in the world, and is also a provider of residential and commercial battery storage and microgrid solutions. And KimPower, the reliable, quick, and scalable EV charging solutions for everyone and everywhere. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. Today, I have two very special guests joining me to talk about their accomplishments. Preeti Chowdhury, who is executive director of Drive Ohio, and Brianna Badanes, the managing director of communications and policy at Drive Ohio, to speak to their strategy, accomplishments, goals, and lessons learned at their organization. And it is so great to have you both here. Thank you for taking your time to come onto the podcast today. Thank you for having us. So hopefully most of our audience has already heard or watched our recent podcast, uh, number 205, published on December 13th, which covered the first NEVI, or National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program funded site, which is funded by a portion of the $5 billion going to EV infrastructure nationwide in the U.S. And so this is the first site to go live in the country, which is, of course, as you two know, just west of Columbus, Ohio, at the Pilot Travel Center at the junction of Interstate 70 and uh, U.S. Route 42, which is an exciting first. So if you haven't listened, definitely do. But firstly, I want to say congratulations to you and everyone involved on this site, which is uh, not only broke ground pretty quickly, but also got live very quickly. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, it's a great milestone for Ohio. We were really excited to get it operational. Yes, I would be too. And um, yeah, like I said, congratulations. It's a a huge first in the space. So before we dive into all of that, can we take it back a little bit? And can you start off by painting a picture of your mission and goals at Drive Ohio? Sure. Um, So Drive Ohio is an initiative of of the Ohio Department of Transportation. We were created uh, first and foremost with safety in mind and with the the mission of using smart mobility technology to make our roads um, and commuting for the traveling public safer and more accessible. So we deal with lots of different smart mobility technology that includes things like connected vehicle infrastructure, basically using connectivity or communication to enhance all of our awareness of what's happening on the roadway. Um, we, we dabble in automated vehicle deployment, again, to try to reduce human error and improve safety. Um, we also, um, I should have said at the start, but we, we consider smart mobility on the ground and in the air. So we have uh, a whole team of folks that deploy drones and thinks about the future of advanced air mobility. And of course, we are also responsible and and are part of our charge is deploying EV infrastructure or thinking about EV infrastructure um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, you know, it ties directly to these other technologies. Electrification really is an enabler for all of these future looking mobility technologies. And two, um, I, I mentioned at the top, but our, our second charge, it's, it's accessibility. And we want Ohioans to have options when they're purchasing a vehicle. We want them to be able to utilize all of those options and uh, not see any barriers in adopting electric vehicles. So we've been thinking about electrification for a while before the NEVI program came to be. Um, so we were really positioned well to kind of hit the ground running. Interesting. I'll definitely ask more of that later because it does seem that you were able to move quickly and I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. So um, Preeti, as executive director there, what are your main priorities with the work that you do? Um, That's a great question. So my main, uh, I guess, charge since I've been here has been to connect this technology work with with people on the ground. Um, More often than not, we, we talk about bright, shiny objects with technology and, and people are really, um, they're excited about using some of this technology, but we don't, we don't always do a great job of connecting that to what people experience today, you know, how this can address and alleviate problems that we see today. Uh, so really I'm trying to connect the use of these technologies to people's lived experiences and trying to be more intentional about how we're deploying these technologies and kind of the purposes they serve. Um, So that's like a big picture 
I guess, vision for what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Um, On the ground, you know, I've been really excited about electrification and this huge investment from the federal government is a big opportunity for all of us. So um, I've been, you know, hopeful that we can roll forward with this program really quickly um, since I started. Um, and, and the other, the other I guess, exciting element of technology that that's happening alongside that uh, ground electrification revolution is, is uh, electrification in the air. So, you know, electric aircraft is also very exciting. Uh, and uh, the prospects of how we can use advanced air mobility to, again, address existing issues that we face um, is, is really kind of eye-opening to think about. So that's another one that, but we're, we're really, we're really just mainly interested in deploying technology to, to benefit Ohioans best and using it as a tool um, alongside a lot of existing engineering and, and all the good work that our Department of Transportation is doing. How cool. I really, you know, we focus obviously on electric vehicles here. I have not thought about taking that to the air. So that's a really cool um, aspect that I I really don't know anything about. So I'll stick to what I do know, but that is really cool that you're thinking big picture and just transportation in general and how to advance mobility, as you say. And, uh, you know, in terms of having a hands-on experience, it seems like you've been working in this space for a while. And of course your background, I know a bit about your background. It has, you know, direct correlation to the work you do now. And part of the advancing EV infrastructure, advancing technology in a way that can help the way that we get around mobility, just basically advance, can, you know, was happening long before Nevi came along. But um, when it comes to your work with Nevi and specifically the federal funding and this whole initiative, can you outline your overarching strategy there, the partnerships and collaborations, or maybe like the general frameworks that you use when taking these subsidies and really going forward with them. Yeah, I can get us started and pretty can jump in. Um, So this is something that Ohio was really planning for quite some time before the NEVI program even existed. So we, um, a few years back, had done a siting study to already kind of identify where those gaps in Ohio were in infrastructure and what our recommendations were moving forward and where those locations should be placed. So that was actually perfect. Once the NEVI program was announced, we kind of had our framework already in place where we could hit the ground running. Um, And we had a lot of uh, that legwork, which did save us some time on the front end. Um, I think um, all the things that Preeti mentioned about um, Drive Ohio and the unique um, ability of our group to kind of focus on emerging transportation technology was a really good fit for the NEVI program um, and gave us another advantage to really getting this ball rolling um, because the program landed pretty squarely in our lap at the Department of Transportation. Um, and we, we really had the resources that we needed to really start uh, this program successfully. Very interesting. Um, being so proactive in this space even though we don't know where it's going, does seem to be key. Even, you know, it's not predictable all the times, but thinking ahead, all right, the technology seems to be going this way. We can see that the administrations are interested in this kind of technology. Even there's, you know, not a lot of things in place. There's a lot of unknowns. It seemed to definitely benefit you to to kind of get the ball rolling, like you said. And um, I was looking into some of the Uh, presentations that you've done before and just stats in Ohio, and you have seen a decent uptick in EV adoption rates and registrations in the state in recent history, which of course, you know, leads us to talk more about what we're talking about. But if people are adopting more EVs, how can the infrastructure fit in? You were already identifying points where there might've been some weaknesses, some charging deserts, or just optimal sites for the future. And so how, if at or to what degree were you involved in building out the NEVI plans? Because I know from my past work in public charging infrastructure, some states, you know, they haven't really worked in this space. So they have to maybe, you know, get some expertise and bring it in and outsource. But how involved is Drive Ohio in the NEVI plan itself that was approved, but that, of course, you have to renew uh, on a timely basis? Right. Um we we are very involved. Um, you know, we we of course we have contractors that help us execute on all manner of work, but uh, we 
really have been very hands-on with the whole Nevi program. Brianna and I specifically have been very hands-on. We have a, a small but mighty team and we've got two other folks that, that help in the day-to-day -day weeds of all things EV infrastructure and, you know, our our team of folks working on, on ground mobility, um, kind of all of them are knowledgeable enough to, to be dangerous. So, um, we've, <laughs> we've had our hands directly on the, the Navi plan and, um, the, the rules and requirements of the program, you know, they were initially announced and, uh, not in, not their final state, but that was enough to get us moving on, kind of refining the siting. As Brianna said, we had a site plan, but we were able to refine that with the with the rules that were handed down um, fairly easily, at least enough to know where our first round of, of stations should be along interstates um, or would need to be per the requirements. So um, that that was sort of um, an easy element to put together. There was a lot a lot of there were a lot of other elements of the Nevi plan outside of where the station should go, but things like how do we <clears throat> how do we contemplate workforce? Um, what are the impacts on equity? How do we actually implement this program? How do we do? How do we contract and how do we do this? Um, not the most exciting thing to talk about, but incredibly um, important and a little bit complex for our for state agencies, not just Ohio, but across the board um, to figure out how to make all those mechanisms work. Um, you mentioned just like kind of how to, the framework for these grant funds and federal funds. And we are no stranger as an agency uh, to using federal funds and specifically at Drive Ohio. Uh, most of our larger projects are federally funded through grants um, of a different nature. But the NEVI funding and just the NEVI program is so different from these other federal funding opportunities. And um, I think mainly it's because this industry is completely new to using federal funds and all of the strings that go along with using those funds. So um, one of the things that we did early on to, to, to help get, get things moving um, and, and, and set us up for actual implementation beyond the plan was we started meeting with industry, with folks like EVgo and ChargePoint and Electro America and all the rest to educate ourselves, but also start introducing to them the federal requirements that they'd be expected to comply with um, if they wanted to bid on this work. I, I think that's really key because you have your own experience in the state of Ohio, you know how that works, you know how your systems work, your transportation department, and then EVgo, ChargePoint, Electrify America know how to put in the infrastructure, but there are shared expertises and a lot of collaboration that I think is essential in every part of this space. Um, when you talk about EVs or just advancing technology to how we're going to get around, it's kind of like you really need to get the group think going on to get everyone together to find who excels where and share those ideas, especially when it comes to new guidelines that you want to meet to get this funding. And do you um, believe that there are any critical things that you did specifically that helped you obtain NEVI funding in ways that you wanted it? I think our NEVI plan was very responsive. So um, when I mentioned those other elements outside of citing um, things like equity and workforce, we actually workforce is part of um, a large part of what Drive Ohio uh, tries to advance alongside all of these technologies because a lot of these technologies are disruptive and we can't ignore that and certainly don't want to. We want to bring work workforce and, and workforce considerations to the forefront. Um, we have a person who's sort of dedicated and extremely passionate about advancing that conversation both in education and also in our incumbent workforce. So um, we were very specific or, or maybe very intentional or tried to be specific as possible around those elements of the program or just advancing EV technology broadly. Uh, and, and I found that the feds were um, very pleased with that you know, with us being direct and, and trying to address some of those issues. It's really hard. You know, some of these conversations are really hard to have. We've talked to folks all over the state and this idea, this electrification wave is not always warmly received, but we're trying to face that, you know, 
directly and um, the more we can talk about it and get get issues laid out um, in our plan and in other ways in conversation, uh, the better off we'll, we'll all be. Of course, you know, I, I initially I was like, I'm sure there's challenges that you have to face just in the requirements themselves that maybe we can talk to as well, but also in in your state with attitudes and beliefs around, like you said, disruptive technology and how that is adopted. So perhaps communication and collaboration have helped bridge gaps there, have you found? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's another challenge that we're trying to meet is just the way we talk about technology, making the language accessible in addition to making the technology accessible. Um, and just, you know, really as we meet with all different types of communities across the state, clearly communicating that this is available to them and the different benefits that it can offer. Um, and so that, I mean, part of the planning process did include public engagement. So we've had meetings throughout the state just to, to do our annual plan update. Um, but now that we're starting to look towards, you know, once all the alternative fuel corridors are built out every 50 miles, we meet that federal requirement, then we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of where these chargers can go, what type of charging is available. And this is where the community conversation is going to be really key in making sure that we find the right places and the right solutions for the different communities around, around our state. Brianna, that is a great uh, segue to my next kind of topic that I want to cover, which is the technology itself. So, of course, there's a strategy with it, fast charging, level two charging, that home charging, not really, you know, our domain. But I'd love to know a, li a little bit more about how you've gone about your work so far with that, starting with, of course, reliability and resiliency of the public EV charging network. This is a hot topic and for good reason. There have been a lot of poor experiences. We're, of course, experimenting with the new technology, but reliability is key, especially when it comes to transportation. You want to know that you can get from point A to B and have a, a good time that when you show up, a charger will work. This is huge. And we all kind of take a little bit of responsibility here, even if we aren't operating or manufacturing the hardware. So uh, we can't get just, just put in the sites and call it a day, as I'm sure you know. So what is Ohio or Drive Ohio doing to enforce higher rates of reliability than the industry is used to today? Well, the the program, as you know, I'm sure requires 97% reliability or 97% uptime. Um, and what we so we were very pleased to see that as as a baseline requirement for these funds. Um, once we started digging into how that was determined, uh, you know, we found that we could maybe most effectively use our contract as a mechanism to enforce that um, even more stringently than is required by the federal guidance. So mm -hmm. we'll be assessing uptime every couple of months. And uh, we plan to pursue unavail unavailability payments, essentially like liquidated damages for people familiar with that sort of contract language for vendors that don't meet that 97% reliability. Um, and that's a little bit more, more of a frequent assessment than the federal rules dictate um, that uh, the feds dictate that you calculate that on an annual basis. But of course, in our engagement efforts, in our tours around the state, um, in our conversations with EV drivers, having a charger down is incredibly impactful. And we need to do everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and I think, you know, a part, uh, we don't have so much control over the technology itself, but we can we can surely penalize folks if the technology is not working as it's supposed to. And we communicate very clearly the expectations um, for that uptime. And, um, you know, we have one station on the ground now, so the process will start now. We're hoping these additional um, kind of contract repercussions for not meeting meeting the requirement will help us out. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely familiar with those and uh, how, I mean, one, the motivator should be that if they're actually going to work, that they work consistently, or if something goes down, that there's very quick response. So it's maybe even unnoticed by the public. But like you said, uh, you know, if you show up, they should work. And so I can, I know that 
this kind of, you know, uptime requirement, not only imposed by the federal government, by the state or by partners is common and necessary. But then we also have to think, okay, they have partnerships with the, with the manufacturers and they're employing, you know, those or, or partnering with them to build the hardware that goes in the ground. Are you involved at all in, or have you just, what, what has been your efforts to maybe inform your team, educate your team about the technology and perhaps the best providers and stuff like that? Or what kind of research did you go into to decide, okay, these are the best partners because they use this kind of hardware and technology, or can you elaborate that on that a little bit? Yeah, for the most part, we looked at um, qualifications. So what, what experience does each of these teams have? And we required as part of their proposals that they provide us the uptime over um, a certain period of time for those like previous fast charger install installations. Um, so that points you to certain vendors that have the most experience at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, is uh, it hopefully speaks to just teams that have more, more experience in this field, specifically with fast charging, because we found, you know, there might be some vendors that have a lot of level two charging out there, um, but we were, I'll say concerned or just, you know, intentional or thoughtful about like, these are fast chargers at a very high power level. Um, we want to make sure that folks that are installing them and operating and maintaining them have the know-how to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it could be a little bit different to, to repair and fix these fast chargers. And we just want to feel like these teams are equipped. This is totally new for ODOT for any DOT. And we don't have like an EV contingent that, that will have the, the familiarity to go, you know, assess issues. So we really have to lean on the private sector for that. Definitely. And uh, we continue to also ask them on our team too, like what technology are, are you considering? Because we, we shouldn't just be stopping at what is working or sometimes not working right now, always improving on finding what is uh, really going to be the, the, the future-proofed hardware, software, firmware that we put in place in the system so that people can have true access to this kind of charging. So um, just as you were speaking about Pretty just then, fast charging has been a huge focus of Nevi. Of course, there's level two, but have you, is Ohio mostly focusing on that fast charging or workplace two? Their balance. Yeah, I mean, I think for for the first couple rounds, we're focusing on fast charging, um, particularly along interstates and along our alternative fuel corridors to meet those minimum requirements. Um, so <clears throat> we're looking at at least four chargers at a location with at least 150 kilowatts per port. Um, but once we get into the future rounds that are a little more discretionary, we'll have to start thinking about things like power availability where a charger is needed. Maybe we won't be able to get 150 kilowatts, but we can still get, you know, a little bit higher or something that makes more sense for that area. So mm -hmm. that's something that we're in the planning stages of now, um, considering not only what type of charger, but where they should go. Um, community locations um, will depend, you know, on, on location. Sometimes it's libraries, sometimes it's, um, you know, existing retail establishments, um, city buildings. Um, so it's just, it kind of really depends on the community. And that's where um, we are in the process now is trying to identify what those future rounds might look like. Very interesting. Thank you, Brianna. And you mentioned the four stalls, and I'm sure some people who listen in know this, but yeah, the Nevi funding, it only says you have to have four stalls. I know that a lot of our viewers are, and a lot of people in general, like, is that going to be enough? Um, but we have to think about, well, this is the, the funding that's outlined. Perhaps states will go forward, you know, especially as they watch the kind of patterns that people need and, and reassess what their citizens need in terms of EV charging. And perhaps have some influence with this kind of requirement or minimum requirement and push that higher. But I think we'll have to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that is the baseline requirement. But mm -hmm. um, if if a team proposed more than four stalls, uh, that's acceptable and allowable. Um, 
And we did find that in the first round. I don't exactly know how many stations proposed. I think it was six stalls, but there were at least a couple. Um, and another consideration, something that we evaluated and, and gave more sort of scoring points to are, are folks that think about um, longevity and, and future proofing. So if they cited the, the four stalls in an area where that would allow for expansion, um, easier expansion in the future, um, and considered that in the installation of the utility connects as well. So um, set yourself up so that we can just hopefully install the chargers and connect to existing utility lines um, more simply. Uh, so all of that is, is you know, it's encouraged um, and it's, in, it's baked into some of the proposals. Okay. Thank you for going to detail there. I, uh, yeah, that's definitely been a question that I've seen and also wondered about myself. So interesting to hear your point of view. And of course, the site that did go live, that is the Nevi funded site that went live west of Columbus, Ohio. And um, the one thing that I noticed was that ha how I had I was covering a Nevi update on one of the podcasts, just kind of updating where, where we are at the state of things, literally across all the states, and how Ohio had broken ground on this site in, what was it, October? And then it was live in December. And immediately I classified this as an example of rapid deployment because it does take a very long time. There's utilities, construction, general permitting, you know, all these things involved. So what specific measures or strategies enabled the launch of this site to happen so quickly? Um, I mean, I think on, so on the front end, when we're talking about utilities, Drive Ohio did do a lot of that work to kind of vet the locations before we accepted proposals. So there was a little bit of things happening simultaneously where we were vetting the utilities. We were, um, citing as we were accepting proposals. Um, so that definitely saved us a little bit of time. Um, and then it really varied vendor to vendor and team to team. Uh, some teams had stockpiled equipment, uh, some didn't. So that can affect, you know, the, the lead time on um, not only the charging equipment, but also the electrical upgrades like transformers. Um, and so we have some teams that had that ready to go, some that will take a little longer. So we are seeing the timelines vary, but this first station was really um, just a great example of kind of everything lining up. We had, you know, the utilities in line, they had the equipment ready to go, the contractor was ready to start. Um, and so once they started, they fortunately did not run into any major issues and were able to just kind of go all the way through, get the station energized, uh, do the testing, and then we were ready to open. Yeah, and I'll add that we, um, it's again, uh, we're lucky that we have Drive Ohio or a team that, that can be dedicated to this work. Um, because we could kind of stay on top of and communicate a lot with our private sector partners. So we were talking to them very frequently, um, you know, heard about they're waiting for a transformer. So, okay, let's make some phone calls to the utility company to make sure that transformer is on the next truck um, and things like that. And we, we intend to continue to stay engaged with each of these installs uh, because we want the infrastructure to be in the ground as fast as possible to support existing drivers out there. We get letters um, and outreach from people sharing stories and they really resonate, you know, people that are, have had experiences where they've either needed a tow or have felt really scared in their vehicle with their families and, you know, have found broken chargers on the road. And so even if they carefully planned their trips and their routes, um, they're still not able to charge. And I, I, you know, I can't imagine that that's very, very terrifying. And so we really want to get these installed quickly. Definitely. So the public feedback and, you know, real lived experiences of owning, driving an EV, charging an EV, being proactive, uh, being very intentional about your processes and your site selection and all of that really seemed to be key to your success so far, which is definitely a cool title to hold, first Nevi site. And of of the lessons learned along the way, what do you think are most significant that you've taken away during the planning and execution of this first site and your first plans that you are carrying over into your future efforts? Um. One lesson learned is that we need to be really flexible 
Um, we, so we're, we're thinking about this as a whole program. Um, this, the funding for this program is dispersed over five years, but then the funding also supports five years of operation and maintenance of these chargers once they're installed. So we'll be working with these vendors and these teams for 10 years, you know, in the future at least. And we've tried to set up uh, processes and mechanisms for us to do this effectively over the long term. Um, and, you know, candidly, like we work for government, we can't hire an enumerate amount of people to work on this. We really, we have a lean team and we have to think about um, how to do this with the resources that we have. So we've set up um, structures and processes and forms and things and uh, have found that it's not that easy for the industry to respond to all of, all of those needs. So we're trying to be flexible as possible, but also, you know, provide some structure so that this can be successful in the long run. Um, as I said, we were really on top of this first installation and intend to be on top of them all. But, you know, once we've got, actually right now, we've got stations that are being designed. Hopefully we'll start construction any minute. We've got our one station that's operational. We're doing a procurement for our second round of installations. Um, so, we have like every phase of project development happening at one time and you know, it's being led by like a couple of people and it's, it's a lot of work. So we're just that maybe I don't have a great um, takeaway as to how we sort of smooth this out in the future, but we um, every time we think we figure something out, we have to flex and adapt to what is actually happening in real time. And that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. And I mean, I'll also add on the communication and the, the public engagement side. Um, I mean, I continue to learn new things on a daily basis just by talking to current EV drivers, folks that are interested in uh, switching to EV. And I think there's definitely an opportunity to use those EV advocates that are in our community to, to help us tell the story a little bit to help us with the, the public education piece. Um, you know, one thing you know, we tried to communicate progress throughout this, um, this first construction build, but, you know, there were constantly folks just driving by and reporting to, you know, fellow EV drivers and different communities on YouTube and social media. So, you know, there's definitely a, a hyper focus on these stations as they start to pop up. So looking for ways where we could potentially leverage that uh, to our benefit to get the word out to folks would be something we would look to do moving forward. It's very true. It is a uh, passionate fraction of, you know, portion of society that is sometimes really tech forward. Sometimes they're just interested and excited about it. And, you know, it's more of that surface level, but the communication can spread like wildfire. I mean, I know that when I first saw the comments on the the update about your site, people were like, yeah, I was just there. Oh, I just missed it. Um, but they're really excited. So I think, like you said, I, I for your team, of course, a dedicated team, but communication around this, I think are also key. And of course you're flexing We're there. Things are, I mean, I'm covering news all the time in this space. It's always changing. And to have a, uh, you know, adaptive approach where you're taking the information knowing that things change and adapting your strategy to that, I think is really essential in this kind of space in general, whether it's EV or just emerging technologies. Do you find that interstate collaboration will be important in the work that you do? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, <clears throat> at, at a service level, just citing to ensure that we're uh, not having any gaps across borders. Um, and it's something we think about a lot uh, with technology, but across the board with transportation generally, we can't have we can't have there be gaps in anyone's experience once they cross the border of any state. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're traveling from here to Pennsylvania or Michigan, you should you should experience the same things. Signs should look the same. Um, you should expect consistency across the board um, with any burgeoning technology, anything new. Um, we're starting at the ground up. So we think about this a lot in technology because uh, there's not a ton of standardization from the top down for many of the technologies that we kind of plan um, and that 
that's something that we have to consider. And there's kind of grassroots uh, collaborations happening among states to make sure that we we're all um singing the same tune, that we're all doing things consistently, and hopefully that we can inform what standards should be. Um, So for the the EV deployment specifically, we, of course, communicated directly with our bordering states about spacing, um, and that goes into our NAVI planning effort. But we've all been talking about what it's like to kind of to to execute on these contracts, uh, how everybody feels about NACs and, you know, the changes in the industry um, and, you know, many, many more topics, just like how we're doing this, how much work it is, how do we use contractors to help us like do some of this planning work and manage the programs. And um, we have conversations regionally. And then even there's a monthly call at a national level, which is bananas, but usually has participation from nearly all 50 states. Wow, that's incredible. I think that will definitely be key because yes, there are state borders, but people cross them all the time, especially on states that border a lot of states. So I think that kind of collaboration, especially to say, hey, this is what worked for us. You should implement it on your end. I think that'll be really important because this is the first time that we're doing this. (laughs) Can you provide some insights into your future plans, expanding either NEVI sites or generally EV infrastructure that you're most excited about that we can look forward to next, perhaps what the second NEVI funded site might be? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we know that yet. We have about nine sites that are like ready for construction within the next few weeks. Um, so as soon as we were able to narrow down which one is going to start second, we'll certainly uh, blast that out for everyone to hear. Um, but so we'll have those nine sites that will start in January, um, you know, hopefully finish up in the springtime. Um, the whole first round includes 24 stations. So all of those are expected to be operational by the end of next year, by the end of 2024. Um, And then like Preeti said, we are already in the middle of um, accepting proposals for round two, which is another 26 locations. So, um, you know, that's 50 stations right there in the next couple of years. Um, I think when all is said and done, we're estimating around 100 sites, um, would be implemented. And, you know, in addition to filling in those gaps to make sure we're reaching all corners of the state, we're also going to be looking at state priorities like tourism and places that people go to visit. Um, We, with our siting study that we did in 2020, we worked with fellow state agencies like the Department of Natural Resources, the Ohio EPA to try to identify some key locations that we might be able to um, leverage other state assets to, you know, get the most bang for our buck and stretch these dollars as far as they can go. Certainly. And of course, this is not the easiest job in the world. Like we've talked about, it's challenging. You have to adapt. How does your team stay motivated to do the work that you've been doing? Uh, I, I think, Working with this particular EV community is greatly satisfying because we get so much feedback, good and bad. It's good to have dialogue. Again, we need to, I think for us, it just feels really good to work on something that we know has a positive impact on on people's experience, on their daily lives, you know, when they're taking a road trip with their family. Um, So, I mean, that certainly motivates me. Um, And I think for our whole team, you know, we all (laughs) monitor our NEVI inbox and are reading the accounts from members of our communities. And and that kind of thing really connects what you're doing while you're sitting at your desk to the real world. And we just try to keep that going. Yeah, I would would echo that. I mean, as someone who has had many years in customer service for a state agency, we get a lot of feedback. Um, and we, I mean, as we should, we're a public agency and, you know, we should hear from the folks that are out on their roads, what they think about the work that we're doing. So while some of that can be negative, it's very rewarding when we hit big milestones like this, when we get this first station open and, you know, we, we show leadership in the country in this one area and really to just be able to celebrate that with the people that it will directly benefit. 
um, is a motivator to, to keep pressing forward and, and working towards more milestones like that. Definitely listening to what's out there and then getting behind the wheel of an EV yourself and seeing what it's like to live that way is very important when you're bringing this to the real world. And thank you so much, Preeti, and for coming onto the podcast today. It's great to get a peek behind the curtain and see how you were able to accomplish the first Nevi site, your strategy in general. It seems like you're really proactive. You are being very intentional and the partnerships and collaboration that you're doing. And of course, the team behind your work is uh, really important to the accomplishment that, that you have achieved so far. So thank you for taking the time and I look forward to seeing what you all do next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you have questions, of course, leave them in the comments, and I'll do my best to get some answers. But thank you again, you two, for joining me. It was great to get to know you and hear all that you have to say about your work. So everyone, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Out of Spec podcast.